And good morning to you all. Welcome, those of you who are on Facebook, those of you who are on Zoom. We appreciate you joining us in whatever format you can, whether it's live or later on, we encourage you to drop us a, a note, drop us a prayer concern, drop a comment. We love to get those. Even better, go ahead and click that like button and uh, click the share button on Facebook so we can reach even more people. This is probably the last time I will attend a worship service in sweatpants. Uh, so there's a little bit of loss with this gain. Uh, I, I've enjoyed doing worship services in sweatpants, but I promise I am not going to bless you with that when we are live and in person. And in fact, of course, uh, since we were together last, I, I have uh, uh, shed enough pounds that I'm back in some very nice suits. I have not been able to wear them anywhere because I've been in sweatpants for almost a year and a half now, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll break them out and, and enjoy them together and uh, encourage folks to come in, in whatever they, they feel like being adorned in when we begin to get together. Um, let's, let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, we do thank you for this blessed day, this early summer, this nice temperate early summer. We thank you, Lord, for the beauty all around us and for the beauty of your holiness that we see in each other, even when we cannot see it in ourselves. Lord, come and fill our conversations and draw us closer to you and closer to one another. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we are getting ready for in-person worship next week, we're doing hybrid worship. And I'm here to tell you, I have never done hybrid worship. I don't know how it's gonna work. Uh, most of the smiling faces I see around on Zoom um, are, are gonna be in person with me most of the time. And so I, I, don't, I don't even know if we will need to continue to do our worship in Zoom or if we'll just go straight to Facebook with it. We'll figure it out together. There, there's a whole lot of things we're gonna figure out together and I promise the wheels are gonna fall off from time to time. Uh, but that's all right. If we're not trying enough things that, if nothing goes wrong, we're not trying enough stuff. So we're, we're gonna, we're going to try together. We're going to succeed together. We're going to fail together. We're going to laugh together. We're going to rejoice together. Most of all, we're going to be together. And we're excited about that. We're excited about whatever way God shows us to share that with folks who are beyond our walls. We did have a good work day yesterday, setting up for worship. And uh, there again, uh, we have set things up as best we can, not having any idea what to expect. We'll adjust all of that on the fly as we go, and we'll figure it out together. Um, I don't know if, uh, if everybody's experiencing this right now, but something in the, in the woods is in bloom. It, it smells to me like holly trees, but I don't see the blooms on the holly trees yet. I'm not sure what it is, but it smells like a holiness Pentecostal church on Easter. Uh, those of you who've never been to a holiness church, uh, you don't know what I mean, uh, but that, that's not a put down. In the holiness church, women are not allowed to wear makeup because that's painting your face like Jezebel. Uh, so you can't be holy and wear makeup. Now, frankly, I, I think some of us guys could benefit from makeup more than the ladies could. 
uh, I think having some kind of, of makeup that would completely erase all of this would be a good thing. But uh, in the Holiness Church, since they can't wear makeup, the ladies make up for it by wearing buckets of perfume. You can, you can smell a Holiness congregation from a mile off because they're not shy about their perfume. My, my wife used to be an Avon lady and holiness women would buy, buy perfume by the gallons. They, they would buy it in the gallon easy pour jug. Uh, and of course, when you have Easter Sunday, you've got the lilies there as well. And that was absolutely what it reminded me of walking through my woods this morning. It, it smelled like a holiness church on Easter. Uh, I'm not sure what's in bloom, but I know something powerful is in bloom. Uh, Robert, are your woods smelling like that? It's hard. To I haven't it noticed it. Tooth, I, isn't it. Yeah, earlier in the season, there was something very sweet smelling, but I, I not now. I, but it's not in my woods. So. Okay. <laughs> or yeah. my, not with my nose, too. My nose right, is not right. great. Uh, yeah, we, we guys are not nearly as good at smelling things as women are. And, and of course, uh, the perfume industry hires women who are expecting because their, their uh, olfactory senses are heightened even more. Uh, and uh, I don't know how all that works out. I've never run a, a perfume industry. Uh, but I promise you, if, uh, if you all want want a heady aromatic experience just drive by my house today and pull in the driveway right about where the creek crosses under the driveway it, it is amazing and the tree frogs are singing because it's rained the past couple of days that's always a joyful thing uh, so we are going to get to scripture sooner or later um, and I'm going to do something unusual for the next couple of weeks. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, use the Old Testament text as the sermon text this morning. And next week, I'll flip them. I'll use the New Testament text as the sermon text, the story of Lazarus coming out. But today, I'm... Um, speaking of the, the text from Ezekiel chapter 37. One of the things I learned in seminary uh, is that the Jewish rabbis, the Jewish uh, Bible teachers said that nobody should, nobody should read the book of Ezekiel until they're at least 30 because it's just too weird for young impressionable minds. Uh, I don't know if that still holds true or not. Maybe they didn't have HBO when uh, the Jewish fathers decided that. I'm pretty sure that the weirdness factor has been erased these days. But this passage, the story of the dry bones, is one of the most beloved passages in all of Scripture, especially for people of color. The idea of God doing a resurrection event uh, is commemorated in the spirit, spiritual, uh, the knee bone collected, connected to the leg bone, and so on. Uh, them bones, them bones, them dry bones, them bones going to rise again. And for Native people, the fact that God wants to move, God wants to create a resurrection event, um, and, and even God Almighty is unable to complete the event until someone turns to the four winds and speaks to the four spirit winds. Um, and, and of course, our question is, is God still waiting for that to happen today? Is God still waiting for us to speak to the spirit and say, Come and give us resurrection. The backstory of that passage is that God's people had been 
defeated, the nation was overrun. They'd been carried off into slavery, into captivity. And they said, look, we're a long way from home, been away from home for three generations now. And the idea of God redoing, restarting, resurrecting anything new is just a non-starter. It just can't even happen. So what do you think? In what, what sense are we where Ezekiel was? Our, our government has not, as far as I saw in the news this morning, has not actually fallen to anybody quite yet. The invading armies haven't come quite yet and run through our streets and sent us elsewhere. But in some ways, we commiserate with Ezekiel this morning. We feel like we are strangers in a strange land. The place has been overrun and people who don't even speak our language as people of the church have overrun the place. So what do you think? In what ways is our situation as the church similar to Ezekiel's situation? Or, or is it just completely non-similar right now? speak to anything else other than I was thoroughly confused when I read that. I, <laughs> I didn't under, begin to understand what we're talking about. And you put some light to it. But uh, generally speaking, I was absolutely confused. Well, see, that's what the rabbis warned about. Maybe you're too young to read Ezekiel, Bill. Uh, may, maybe you're just not quite ready for it yet. Maybe you're not 30 yet. Yeah. Anybody else have, have any reaction to where we're at and where Ezekiel was at? I'll be the second person again. Um, <laughs> uh, just thinking what, on one hand, it's like, yeah, I, I actually thought of this before reading this passage. I've heard it lots of times, you know, that this was, they didn't know about the rest of the story. It was like the temple had been destroyed. Everybody had been hauled off to this nasty bunch of he wicked pagan heathens, the Babylonians, and we're living in exile and Ezekiel's there with them. And it's like, everything God had promised them is, is fallen flat. Nope, you know, there's no place to worship, no place to do the sacrifices. It's like, you know, God's given up on us. We've been bad um, or our God's given up is, is failed. and. Um, and in that context, Ezekiel says, you know, okay, so yeah, they're dry bones, the Israeli nation, the Israeli religion, it's, it's dead and dry and it's gone. Like, can this live again? You know, yeah, right. Um, and on the other hand, you've got, um, you know, the charts of Christian denominations in, in America, in, in America, the, the, the and certainly all, you know, they show that religion in general, certainly organized religion is all the lines are sloping down. Um, yeah, and, and we break it down by denomination. It's, it's all your, your big mainline denominations that were the top of it in the 50s and the 60s. They, were, they ran the show. They, they were it. You know, everybody else was these small little groups. It's like they're the ones particularly that have just they've been plummeting. Nobody wants to go there anymore. They're not relevant. Um, and the Methodists are right in the middle of that. And we, of course, have our, our controversies of our sexuality, and you got people on both left and right leaving because they don't, you know, either they're tired of the fighting or they don't think they can win uh, one or the other. And, and, um, and even our solutions to kind of peacefully try to split up the different groups into their own groups and their own denominations, that's been put off and it's not, you know, who knows when that's actually going to get voted on and happen. Um, it's like, can this thing live? You know? <laughs> Um, so I think it's certainly relevant. Yeah, if you give it, you know, looking at those pic pictures, um, they're obviously very different situations. Uh, uh, but certainly the the wish to, you know, the, the the temptation to despair over this particular thing um, 
in this particular situation is I think great in, in both. And, and I appreciate your thing about, yeah, you can, you can bring everybody together. You can get them all to assemble together and make a lot of noise and raise a lot of dust. But is there any life there? <laughs> it's like, is there a spirit there? Um, and that's quite a question. That's, that takes some prophecy. That's, boy. <laughs> a little, uh, well, that reminded me of a little story about a young African um, missionary who'd been just working out in the bush and just in the most primitive conditions. And somehow, it, you know, his, some people were sponsoring him from America, brought him to America to show him, you know, what the church was doing here. Maybe he could learn some lessons. And he, they, you know, got to show him some of their big churches and their amazing programs, and their Sunday schools, and their outreach programs, and their food banks. And afterwards, they asked him, so what did you learn? What did you think about all this? And he was like, wow, I had, I had no idea. I had no idea that, that the, the church could do so much without the spirit. It was oh, amazing. So hopefully that's not the lesson we learned. I was like, yeah. Right. That's a, a really salient point, Robert, and, and a really important insight. Um, Donna, looks like you're either trying to run away or trying to speak. I'm not sure which. I, I'm trying to speak. When I read it, or when I listened to it today, I thought about how it relates to where we have been the last 14 months. Even though we've been blessed to be able to have our Zoom, we're still not together. And I think with next Sunday coming up, it's like, let's see what's going to happen. You know, I know for myself, I have missed it and I feel like dry bones. I mean, I'm here and, you know, staying pretty isolated for all that time. And yesterday with my grandson's graduation was the first time that the whole family was able to get together. And it was just refreshing. It was a new experience. It was like, the old being new again. And so that brings to me that next Sunday, I hope to feel the same refreshment that I felt yesterday with my family, to have that with my church family. Amen. And being all <laughs> Yeah, a little more background. By this point, uh, the folks had settled into Babylon. Uh, the Hebrew writing system came from Babylon. We know that because we have ancient Hebrew writings that look nothing like modern Hebrew. But once they started adopting the Babylonian system, that's where modern Hebrew characters came from. Um, they, they settled in in many ways. One of the ways they settled in was by building a lot of small in-home churches, that's called a synagogue. And the synagogue movement began in Babylon. The, the Pharisees were behind that movement. The Sadducees thought everything had to happen in the temple. The Pharisees were the first to say that you could baptize people into the Jewish faith. So for the first time they were making converts Folks in the diaspora, that is spread throughout the Babylonian empire, were not sure that it was a good idea to come back, come back to what? There's no temple there, there's no city there, there's no walls there, there's no buildings there, it's all just a bunch of rubble. And you want me to leave a very comfortable life here and go back to what? And the question was, all this old, ancient, dried up religion, aren't we getting past that? It, is, is that really something that can reach the kids of this modern Babylonian age? They're listening to Babylonian disco, they're speaking Babylonian as their first language, they're watching Babylonian HBO, What's going to make them want to come back to something old? 
And you'll notice that in this passage, Ezekiel does not invite anybody to come back to something old. He says, the old ones are going to be resurrected to something new. Before I quit uh, kicking this metaphorical horse, I, I have to point out that, of course, for Black people experiencing slavery in America, the idea of being carried off to captivity and looking for a resurrection, that, that was an incendiary thought. And for them, it was something that provided the power of God to get them through the soul-crushing experience of slavery. For Native people, the idea of being exterminated did the same thing. And, and turning to the four corners makes this evidence that God is a good Indian. Uh, and of course, today, the... Uh, uh, Native population is one of the fastest growing minorities in America. Uh, so God is doing some new things. And, and we are having the same discussion in Native uh, groups of believers of uh, how much can we go to these old dried out teachings and expect young people, new people to plug into those. So, let me pause there. Go ahead, Sharon. I think hardest uh, part, or uh, my brain's kind of all over the place, but um, hardest part with the last thing you said is not watering down the message um, when we um, are trying to um, make an inviting place and, and, and truly be the kind hands and feet of Jesus and accepting and forgiving of all things. But then when they seem so insanely weird <laughs> of uh, newer culture things that it's, it, uh, it puts you in a pickle um, to, to not be, uh, to, to articulate that voice in a language that speaks to the circumstance that I'm going to say young people, because that's kind of what affects my world. Um, what speaks to them and what hurts them, um, but trying to translate some of the situations that they get into um, is a little bit difficult. Um, but I guess, you know, planting the seed, this is not new. We think it's new. We think the church is dying, but something's always, there's always been an antithesis. There's always been... Um, uh, 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 a slavery uh, uh, where you've had to leave your country or you've been taken over. There's always been that. And I guess we just have to keep in the faith that um, we're still planting seeds um, regardless. But yes, we have to become innovative. Um, the other thought was, um, I think this was back to Donna, just um, um, that there's so many references in the Bible about that cool water. And I think the cool water is what balances those dry bones. Um, you know, what it feels like when you're dehydrated and how, how nice that drink of cool water. If you forgot your water bottle and you've been running around in your car or it's hot outside, you know, what that does to the soul, even um, submersing in water or taking a shower, you know, you feel better after you've bathed, <laughs> that kind of stuff that um, I think that's the, the old dry bones is, is certainly a great metaphor for the last 14 months, like Donna was saying, that um, even we didn't speak as much, like, like I haven't spoken to anybody this morning, so my voice sounds a little weird, um, that, that uh, your, your drink of water helps your voice. Um, and so um, there was that reference that I've been thinking about with your message and also, um, uh, you can help me out, Pastor Larry. The, um, the the Greek word for breath and wind and spirit is the same word. So that in in essence, in the message, he's he's saying, I I still need you to help me. The Spirit's telling us that we're like, what? You know, if you're all knowing and ever present and omnipotent and all those good big words, then um, I guess it makes my heart feel good that um that i really i am really need needed um to to be a part of this big great um 
uh, spirit. Um, and yeah, I think that was it. It was uh, the, the, the breath, wind and spirit thing was, um, that was kind of new to me that I didn't understand before. Amen. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's an important insight. And it's, it's one of those few times that I think it's actually helpful to go to the original language and hold it up to light. Um, so, uh, Robbie, you, you and the dog were wanting to talk a minute ago. I don't want to uh, go on. I don't want you to lose your thought. You're muted again, though. It's already gone. Okay. Well, that that happens sometimes. See, we've learned how to read lips on Zoom. <laughs> I'll be back shortly. Okay, I was afraid of that. <laughs> All right. Yes. Uh, the the whole idea of God being omnipotent, omnipresent, uh, omnipotent and omnipowerful are, are pretty, pretty much the same word. Uh, immutable, God never changes in any way. Most Christians believe these things, and even non-Christians believe these things about God. Uh, the fact is, though, that those are... Uh, the, those are Greek philosophy terms. They are not from the scripture. And the, the fact that God loves, I think, is evidence that God is not immutable. Because anytime you love, it changes you. And in fact, uh, God says in, in the scriptures things like, I have changed my mind. I have repented, which is often translated in the, the new translations. I have turned in a new direction, which means I have repented. Uh, these things mean that, that God does change. And the story today is evidence that God does change when we get involved. Any other thoughts on these things? And that, My uh, only other one. Oh, oh go ahead, Robert. Ah, uh, I guess kind of a little confession. Yeah, I find it's not so much, it's more it's an emotional reaction. It's like, do I, do I want to get be back and seeing other people? You know, it's that, that, that being somewhat of an introvert, it doesn't come across on Zoom probably, but I am. <laughs> it's like I've gotten kind of comfortable just being here by myself and my family and you know and, and uh not going out a whole lot and actually being out with people and in front of people and you know doing that the gosh I, you know I, I gotta get back out there again okay do I want that well it doesn't matter really whether I want to or not but uh, yeah so it's kind of confessing those emotions <laughs> Exactly. There, I mean, there's been a comfort level here. There's been something gained by all of this. Go ahead, Robbie. All right. Um, everything in education seems to run in 20 year cycles. That's what it's looked like to me anyway. Uh, the only thing that really changes is the vocabulary and that just means that there are more synonyms now. This word means the same as that word. Okay, it, the exact same sentence written with different words, still meaning exactly what it always meant. Uh, I kind of sort of, kind of sort of feel that the same thing has been going on throughout time. It's kind of like every 20 years, we need a good war to get things straightened back up, get all the economies straightened out, and then realize, oh, wait a minute. God had this working all, all along before. So why don't we get back into the church, get back into the temple, and make sure that everybody understands, I believe. And 
I agree with the Lord. Well, we have 20 years to forget all about that. And it seems like people are doing a good Robbie, we were with you for a while, but you, you just dropped off. Your, your internet feed just cut you off. Um, Give me a thumbs up or something. You're there now. Okay. Am I back now? You are. Oh, with dear a Lord. At which point did it cut out? <laughs> uh, we're, just before you said something sensible. Something simple? <laughs> sensible. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right now now i'm just stretching um we so don't we were on synonyms synonyms yeah okay we're not i like synonyms okay. synonym right with we're butter not. and toast all right. Do I need to turn this thing off and back no. on? No, you're okay. I always me. I just said I like synonym on my buttered toast. <laughs> you are one sad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you cut out again, Robbie. Maybe you should uh, sign out and and sign back on Robbie yes. we need to we forget God forget 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 then oh here he is yep need him here he is he's saving the day oh okay we can forget him again forget 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 oh we need him again uh, that's the change that needs to take place we need to stop this bull of thinking we can do it on our own and well, thank you, Reba McIntyre, but give this world back to God, you know. And uh, thank goodness I heard that that song this morning. And uh, well, it's one of my favorites. Now I don't know if I've said anything that y'all want to expand on, or if uh, it's, it's maybe just one long run-on sentence. But. Um, that's about it for right now. And that's, that's a warning, okay? That's it for right now, okay? Uh, probably gonna come back in a few minutes, okay? Is all that all right? Bobby, that's cool. All right, so. we're, we're going to uh, go ahead and start our worship portion. Uh, Sharon, do you, do you have anything you wanna share as we do that? Hopefully I can roll over into the 10 o'clock hour. Okay. Uh, well, we're, we're going to uh, begin with our, our litany now, and uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. You're welcome to join along with me. Lord, we dwell in a dry and weary land. You alone can give us hope. You alone have the words of life. To whom else can we turn? Come and breathe your Holy Spirit and let us rise again. And Mike Kerr is with us here to lead us in the responsive reading and share the other scriptures with us. Uh, if you like, you can unmute for the responsive reading so that we can hear you joining in. Good morning. Please join me in the responsive reading, Psalm 16. <clears throat> Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make you my make life. My life secure the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places surely, surely I, I have a delightful inheritance i will praise the lord who counsels me even, even, at, even night, at night my heart shows me the, the way i keep my eyes always on the lord with him at my right hand with him I at my right hand i will not be shaken therefore my heart is glad and my spirit rejoices my body also will my rest body secure. also will rest secure <clears throat> because you will not abandon me in the realm of the dead nor will you let your face nor will you be decay. decay 
You make known to me the path of life. You fill me you with fill joy, me in, with your joy in your presence. With eternal pleasure. Eternal pleasure at right hand. your right hand. The gospel lesson this morning is from John 11. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. The sermon text this morning is Ezekiel 37. And as was said earlier in the uh, Bible study portion, it's thrown a couple of curveballs to everybody or mm -hmm. to some of us. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out of the, by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophecy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord say to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy prophecy to the breath, prophecy, son of man, and say to it. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breathe from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone, we are cut off. Therefore, prophecy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Mike, would you care to lead us in a word of prayer? Sure. Heavenly and precious Father, give us wisdom to understand these words give us foresight to engage in, in the thoughtful meditation required to understand what they what they mean and that we're not just watching an episode of uh, the walking dead or some zombie movie lord it's it's all about what is our 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 promised land journey. We ask that uh, you look upon us kindly 
and you guide us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mike. I, I appreciate the uh, Walking Dead illusion there and the, the zombie movie illusion because it's dead on. See what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it is spot on because, you know, the fact is, this is a dumb question. Uh, you may uh, you may be aware that in the news recently there was a horrific discovery in Canada, not the first. We pray it will be the last, but it may not be. Uh, of a boarding school that had thrown hundreds of children into a mass grave. And when they were excavating that, if you had showed up and said, hey, y'all, you think those bones can live again? Uh, first of all, somebody should punch you. And, and secondly, the answer would be rather obvious, wouldn't it? So then why would Ezekiel use this as a metaphor for God's people when the question being asked is really pretty dumb? Well, truth is, over my years, I've done this since 1982, I am nearer the end of the journey than I am to the beginning now. And over my years, I have served lots of zombie churches. Now, they would come together, they would make some noise, but their future was entirely in their past and their progress was entirely attained in reverse. Um, by the way, I, I think I've mentioned before, my all time favorite movie is called Smoke Signals. And it's a, a movie set on a reservation. Um, and it's a profound movie. It's about how, to, how do you forgive somebody who dies before they get a chance to ask for forgiveness? How do you find that forgiving moment in your heart? So it, it's powerful on a lot of ways, but one of the main characters in the movie has a 65 Chevelle all in primer and the only gear left is reverse. So she spends the whole movie backing up. Now, this movie is a lot of fun to watch anytime, but it's especially fun to watch in a room full of Indians. Trust me, I know. And, and one of the things that happens when this character is, is backing up through the whole movie is every time that Chevelle comes on in reverse, the Indians in the room say, I think I had that car one time. Uh, we, we've, we've all experienced this where the uh, old manual transmission starts shelling out gears one at a time. And it's not surprising at all that reverse is the last one left. It's also a metaphor, isn't it? That uh, a lot of reservation life is still firmly in reverse, and we measure our progress by how far backwards we go. I have served a lot of reservation churches. I've never served anywhere on the res. I've served a lot of zombie churches. I've never served in the graveyard. But I've served a lot of churches who come together, make a lot of noise. There's flesh on flesh and bone on bone, but there is no spirit no vision, no movement forward. And the, the powerful moment in this passage is when Ezekiel hears from God, it's not enough to have a form of life. It's not enough to draw a crowd. You have to draw the spirit into action before there is life. Now, I've served some zombie churches 
Grace Hartwood is not one of them. The spirit has been present there way before I showed up. And my deep and sincere prayer is that I won't mess it up, that the spirit will still be there when I leave. But I have never served a church that could identify with this passage more than Grace Church. And it's not because of anything y'all have done, it's because of what COVID has done. For 14 months, 15 months now, we have been dead in the water. And yeah, we've, we've been able to keep some life stirring. We've been able to breathe on the coals and make sure they didn't go out because we've had these groovy technological tools. But honestly, the truth is everything we hope and dream for our church has been entombed in quarantine for 15 stinking months. I have never had a church that needed a resurrection as much as Grace United Methodist Church needs one today. And we're not alone, are we? The, the church all over the place needs a resurrection. One of the things that Ezekiel was asking without putting it into words, and this is how you can tell that something is inspired, is because Anytime I want to put something into words, I wordsmith it and hammer it in there. Ezekiel never says this, but he paints a picture so you can say it. The question for Ezekiel's day is, we're living in a different culture. We're living in a different world than we left. Can this dry old religion that we still want to hold dear, is it dried up and dead on arrival? Or is there a spark of life? And Ezekiel makes the claim, yes, there is life, but not in going backwards, not in putting the Chevelle in reverse and backing up for 90 minutes. We don't measure our progress in the rear view, saying, wouldn't it be great if we got back to before Jerusalem fell? We don't ever see any time in scripture where God's people have advanced through a strategic retreat. So God is calling us to new life. God is calling us to, to share that new life in bold new ways. But God is not calling us to go back to 2019. God is calling us to a new resurrection moment. And here's the thing, and this I think is one of the most profound moments of scripture. Ezekiel's not unique in this insight, but this is significant. Not even God can resurrect his people until somebody is bold enough to stand up and speak to the spirit and say, come spirit and bring new life. Now, um, this, this holy act of boldness is called prophesy in this passage. But I don't want you to think you get off by saying, well, I'm not a prophet. I don't have to prophesy. Because that, that's part of the point of the message as well. Prophesying doesn't mean predicting the future. That's the way it's used today. But that's not what it means in the Bible. Prophesy doesn't mean foretell the future. It means tell forth. God's will, God's love, God's grace, and God's mercy. Telling forth the will of God is prophesying. And every baptized believer is called to do that every day. We pastors are called to do it at least once a week for an hour. But every believer is called to speak God's will every day or even better, to live God's will in such a way that people hear it without words. 
So that's the sermon recap for the day. Uh, Sharon, you were our bridge person. Go ahead and bridge us over to this discussion. You had done it for me. Um, literally, the, the last thought I had <clears throat> from the Bible study uh, portion was, and you can, you can help me, okay, the communication in Ezekiel um, is God's talking to Ezekiel and telling him. Yeah. So what I, what I wrote down was that, that I thought it was weird um, that it was like a Johnny on the spot uh, prophet, like, who all of a sudden, you know, you're um, Isaac or um, uh, you know, I'll mess, I'll mess up definitely if I try to quote prophets, but um, um, that, that God was just, uh, it seemed like a conversational kind of prophet that uh, I just, I, I'm asking you to prophesy, you know, uh, um, and I, I guess it, um, the more we've talked about it between last half hour and this is um, that really it all boils back down to faith. Like how much faith do I have? If I say move mountain, that it's actually going to move. I'm going to say probably not enough. Mm -hmm. And he's asking Ezekiel, if I understand correctly, to bring these bones to life. And like you said, with a, a mass grave or something, you'd be carted off in a paddy wagon to, you know, if you, when we when we try to translate supernatural things into a just a human condition world, yeah, you know, maybe all the people who are in mental institutions, maybe <laughs> you know, we would all be thrown away. We would all be uh, put away, I should say. Um, and and so that's where uh, it does get as weird as the the um, dawn of the dead kind of thing that Mike said. Well, I'm dating myself because that's older. But um, do we really believe and have enough faith that we can move mountains and we can make dry bones come to life? Yeah, um, it's a good question, because let's face it, it's easier to put the Chevelle in reverse than, than it is to try I to- I did see, I did watch the movie. <laughs> I didn't have any Indian friends, but <laughs> did watch the movie. <laughs> that, that still counts. It's easier to put things in reverse and measure our progress in the rear view mirror. Uh, saying, yeah, we're and not the, back where we were in 1954, but at least we're getting closer. Uh, and the, the second thought that, that you said, like I said, you, you handled it for me because my other thought that came to pass with the, the sermon was, I always thought prophecy or prophesying was a gift from God given to a particular person in the Old Testament. That's what I thought it was. You know, I just, I never thought that it was, it was telling God's, you know, speaking God's word forward, forth, forward. So um, it's really evangelizing, right? I mean, it's, that's all it is. It's kind of the synonym to Robbie's synonym for the same thing. So yeah, let's pause right there and remind ourselves that in the New Testament, Paul tells us about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and he begins to outline what the gifts of the Spirit are. And he says, some of you all have gifts of hospitality. Now, if you pause right now and you think of the last a uh, social event that you got to attend at the church, you know that there are people who are waiting on folks, people who are ministering to make people feel comfortable, people who are facilitating uh, uh, um, facilitating meetings, you know, saying, uh, here, let me enter, introductions, that's what I was looking for, facilitating introductions. These are people who just ooze hospitality. Um, good works is a gift of the spirit. There are people who just do good stuff and you go, man, why didn't I think of that? What? 
what's wrong with me? Well, it's a gift. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. There are people who giving is a gift of theirs. They, and it doesn't matter what their bank account says. There are people who are better at giving and making the person receiving feel lifted up by the gift instead of feeling brought down and saying, uh, here, I, I have abundance and you have little, so I'm giving down to you. No, people with the gift of giving. Prophecy is right there in the mix. And it's considered a normal part of the church, the body of Christ. It's not an extraordinary thing. So to a certain extent, we're all called to exhibit those gifts of the spirit, all of us. And each of us has a particular area where we excel. And you know who the last person is to notice what your area of excellence is? You. You are the last person to notice what you do better than anybody else, because it's natural to you. So that's where Christian conversation comes in. We look each other in the eye and we say, you know what I appreciate about you? You are so good at and usually when somebody finishes that sentence, the person hearing it says, are you sure you've been watching me? Because I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, the fact is there are prophets in Grace Church. And those prophets are the last person to realize that they are prophets but they are the ones who can strip away the nonsense and say, this is the word of the Lord for us today. This is where God is calling us to move. Janet Grimsley, you've joined us. Uh, you, you may feel a little bit uh, harried, but that's all right. We always treasure hearing from you. Yeah. Um... Uh, kind of a little late to the conversation, so my brain's not really into the moment right now. But I will say this this passage has always been a struggle for me in trying to um, understand it. There's a lot of music written about it, <laughs> even, and I still don't understand, you know, when they start singing about all the dry bones and all the different things. And so this has helped me. Um, I guess to me is the realization that uh, truly the main point being that the, there is no life without the Holy Spirit, that it takes the Holy Spirit to move us and to get us going. Amen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, there's a big difference between raising up an army of God and raising a crowd. There, there are a lot of folks who just desperately want to say, well, the church isn't succeeding until we, we draw a crowd. I can draw a huge crowd to Grace Church today before we even open the doors. All I have to do is set it on fire. And Mike will tell you, fires draw a big crowd. Now, it's not something you can replicate week after week. It, it's pretty hard to do over and over. But if you want a crowd, I can draw a crowd. You may want something other than a crowd. You may want some sign of spirit life to go with the crowd. And that's different. And I think that is a huge failing of, uh, of ours in which we do focus on numbers so much and um, that we do forget that it does take much more than just getting the people there. Um, that it does, it, it does take, you know, we, we forget the, if we get the peer, people there, then we're, we're in a frenzy We've got lots of people here. Isn't this wonderful? We've 
yeah, it's wonderful, but you know, the spirit is the one that's got to come through this place and, and, and do the magic, I guess. Amen. Robbie, it looks like you're, Robbie says no. Okay. Uh, David Givens, do you feel like prophesying? No prophecies from David Givens? All right. Uh, Just a, a little sidebar was uh, to Janet's point um, that um, even got a little, a little flack um, at a leadership meeting or a trustee meeting or any kind of meeting that um, there, for, for me, there was a transition to realize that we need to ask the Holy Spirit to be in all things that um, if we're replacing the air conditioning unit, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to be there and bless this and um, the hole in the foundation currently um, be there, bless this. And, and um, uh, it, it sets a different tone of your heart when that's the first thing we say. And that's, that's typically the first thing we do say, you know, in our worship services to, to ask the spirit to descend upon this, um, our work day yesterday, you did pastor Larry, um, asking that, that the spirit be here in what we're doing, no matter how great or small. Amen. Thank you for that, Sharon. Robbie, it looked like you were going to speak and then you ran away. Robbie's pacing today. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know you could pace, Robbie. <laughs> uh, I heard a bunch of noise coming in through the back door, so I closed it, and uh, I don't hear it now. That's cool. Um, the, this, I guess, this pas uh, this passage brings up a huge question with me. Um, I feel like I'm remembering from days back in Sunday school that when we were talking about Jesus and coming back to life, that there was a passage in there somewhere that said that Jesus is the only person that has come back to life. And I don't know if, if I'm correct or not, but then I started thinking about Lazarus and, and I said, well, uh, he came back to life, but then I'm remembering another passage where Jesus said uh, he was only sleeping. He said that to uh, Lazarus's mother, I believe. Now, am I mixing up passages or am, am I, I, I don't know exactly where I'm going because Ezekiel, this one we're working on today, really threw me for a loop. When is, now, he just brought a whole valley full of folks back to life. And, okay, well, if you understand, can you at least understand my confusion? Uh, I'm with you, Robbie, absolutely. Okay, well. And, and you're at, <laughs> we'll, we'll do this more in part two next week when I'm going to concentrate on on Lazarus for our first sermon together. But thank you, because I was feeling bad about sending it down another track and not getting all the answers. Thank you. But in the Old Testament, we have cases where prophets lift up people who have died back to life. Uh, so the resurrection is not proof that Jesus is unique. That, that's a thought that lots of preachers have had, but it's not scriptural. Uh, it kind of goes with those ideas of Im immortal, invincible, immutable, uh, unchanging, uh, you know, all those philosophical constructs that people think are good orthodoxy, but, but they're not from the scripture. Um, the... Uh, the ancient world had lots of stories of gods and demigods who were resurrected. 
So the resurrection of Jesus didn't prove that he was unique. It was his life, death, resurrection, and ascension, all of it put together that makes a unique thumbprint of God's presence. Mike, go ahead. Well, I, I think that I think that passage speaks to the future in that um, you get in that Chevelle and you find first gear somehow and you just slam the pedal down to the floor and, and just scream forward as fast as you can go and fast forward to, to Revelation and to the day of rapture. And who's the first ones to be raised? Mm -hmm. The dead, the bones. They're first. So, Amen. Just a Good insight. Hey, Bill Davenport, I don't know if you realize it, but you've got a good insight on this. Um, I, have, I have looked at a lot of houses in my time. Um, and Barbara and I used to flip houses occasionally uh, over my, my time as a pastor. I have made a lot more money with real estate than I have as a preacher. <laughs> that, that doesn't mean I'm ready for a home improvement show. It just means real estate is a better investment than a seminary degree. That's all that means. Uh, but I've learned some code words to watch for that scare the bejesus out of me. Uh, one of the code words that you all probably know is, has a lot of great potential. When you see that in a real estate ad, you, you can start to run. Uh, another house that, uh, another uh, phrase that you should raise an eyebrow about is something that says vintage or historical. But one of the dead giveaways that there are big problems is good bones. This house has good bones. Bill can speak to houses with good bones. Um, and, and really that's part of what we're, we're talking about as we talk about the resurrection of Grace Church is, okay, we don't have to invent this from nothing. The, the faith we've been given has good bones, but the bones themselves are not enough for new life. It takes the spirit to bring us together, to bring us flesh on flesh and bone on bone, and to bring us a vision of the future. Bill, tell us about the last house you sold, or even worse, that you bought, that had good bones. You know, the words are powerful. Uh, you know, we don't we don't give enough credence to how words impact us. Uh, the terms that you used uh, describing real estate, uh, absolutely. I mean, those they're not code words. They're just words that indicate a condition. Uh, so, homes. I, I will tell you. Uh, I just I just sold a home. Uh, in Vienna, which is a super hot market, mm -hmm. uh, and the home sold for well over list price, as which most homes today are selling at. But the reality is, is people saw beyond the home. Uh, they saw the potential in the home. Was it uh, brand spanking new? No, it was built in 1953. Uh, but the home was in good, good condition, like our souls. Uh, you know, we work hard to get our souls in good condition. So when it comes time for, for be held accountable for what we've done in this life, uh, we can get, hopefully get the appropriate reward for that. And it's like real estate, you know, you make good decisions uh, and you are rewarded for that in the future. Yeah. And you're right about how you talk about uh, homes you buy, you, <laughs> you gotta be careful. You know, you gotta make good decisions. Uh, and it's, it's like our faith life, it's the same story. Uh, we need to make good decisions about what we do and the words we use and the examples we set. Uh, so uh, from that perspective, our real estate and life, our faith life, similar? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. 
Go ahead, Robert. Something that came to me about the zombie thing, you know, it was like <laughs> one thing with, because really when I've heard this passage, the very end comes to mind and I see all these, this great army standing up and they're all just kind of standing there stiff and like, yeah, they're an army, they've been given breath, but they're just standing there waiting to all do the same thing together. I realized, no, you got one thing, it's, it, the passage starts with Ezekiel saying, I was in the spirit. So he could prophesy then what God told him. And then the breath, the spirit comes into all these bodies. They all stand up. Now they all have the spirit too. It's the thing about you get a bunch of bones, you can in bodies even, you just kind of move around and organize and put in ranks. But you know, you got a whole bunch of people who are alive. Suddenly they can start prophesying themselves and God can speak through them and do stuff. And suddenly you don't have near as much control over what's going on. <laughs> um, and, and God can quite surprise you by what happens with all these people suddenly who are alive with the spirit in them. Um, so sometimes it's, for especially people, leadership is a little uncomfortable having everybody actually with the spirit because it's, you, it, you're not so much, you're not just the only one in the spirit anymore. It's like, so. You're not the boss. You're not the boss, right. yeah. You, you can't understand why clergy want to claim that the spirit flows through me. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that ain't true. Go ahead, David. Well, I did have something to say now. And after this real estate analogy, how do we describe grace? Uh, we've got good bones. Um, we've been there for years. We're four generations. They're in the cemetery. So in starting out, I see that we are the bones. And it's going to take the congregation and our community to come and make this church grow. Is that the correct I mean, is that where we're, we're really, I know it's simplifying it, but that's pretty much what we're saying here, right? Hey, David, one of the great things about a prophetic vision is however you interpret it is yep. correct. It's, it's like asking what, well, you can see that beautiful artwork behind Sharon's head there. Mm -hmm. What does that artwork mean? Well, you can't interpret it wrong because what it means to you is what it means. Well, that's kind of where we're going here. We're saying we've got a great church. It's got a good foundation. It's lovable. It's, it's, it's friendly. It's been there for generations. And come and make us grow together into the church that this community needs. Amen. Amen. Great insights. You know, David makes the point, uh, and I think, I think I'd like to reinforce that point. Uh, the faith family of Grace Community, it's just astonishing. It, it, it is an amazing thing, uh, and it's certainly one of the reasons Deborah and I enjoy being part of that faith community because of what it is, uh, welcoming, loving, kind, sharing. You can do all the great adjectives that you can apply to these kinds of things, certainly apply to grace. Amen. We got Be sure you add in wacky. Yeah. <laughs> Be sure you add in wacky. <laughs> I will do a sermon one day on how God raises up characters. Um, Grace has a fairly good number of characters. Now, the first church I served was on the Mississippi River and it was resplendent with characters. I had a hard time visiting people in the hospital because I didn't know anyone's given name. They all went by nicknames. Uh, and you, you can't go into a hospital and say, I want to see Odie. <laughs> so, uh, a lot of characters in that first church, um, a lot of characters in grace. Got to confess to you though. Apparently, you have to get up around 3,000 square feet where the oxygen starts to be depleted to have the, the largest number of characters per square inch. Because uh, my mountain congregations, they've had you all beat for unusual characters nine ways to Sunday. But well, that's, that's all for another day. Uh, Donna, Elizabeth, Cora, any of you all want to contribute? 
Donna says she's out. Not hearing from Cora or Elizabeth, that's okay. Uh, anybody else with any thoughts? Oh, go ahead, Cora. I'm just listening and taking it in, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, any well, other, go mine, ahead, Karen. Mine is off target, I guess. Um, it, it, was, it was relevant five minutes ago or something. Somebody was going into, um, Robert, I believe, going into how these bodies just stand up. And then we went into, Mike went into like plowing through to Revelation in the Chevelle. And so this is just a curious question that's a little off target. If we are raised, the, the, that's what it was, the, the dead were raised first. And so, Pastor Larry, give me your advice on cremation. There are some things I've read that cremation's not cool because you're supposed to come back in your body. Help me out with that. It's a little off target. It's a whole lot off target, Sharon. It's <laughs> way another day. Uh, in in uh, in in Native American parlance, we call that W O D. That stands for way out there. <laughs> but just curious but it's all right because we we do throw this open for conversation i'm gonna i'm gonna touch on it but not explain it um in the apostles creed we say i believe in the resurrection of the body we say that every time we say the apostles creed now that's a jewish article of faith that i don't know anybody in modern life who truly believes that when we get to heaven, we're going to be resurrected in this body. Uh, we believe that we are resurrected in some fashion, but frankly, if God's going to put me back in this temple of clay, I don't want to go. <laughs> I'm hoping to have a new and improved Chevelle that has a lot more gears. Uh, for a lot of folks who feel like uh, cremation disrupts the opportunity to resurrect the body, they're scared of cremation. My feeling is if God can resurrect you out of the grave, God can resurrect you out of the ashes. And uh, I, I don't feel like it's, it's our task to make sure we keep our dead bodies in shape to make resurrection easier for God. The important thing is there's a resurrection coming and how you dispose of this temple of clay is a personal choice. And I'm not going to scold anybody for cremation and I'm not going to scold anybody for, for embalming. Um, it, it's all a personal choice, it's, it's all uh, a transition for us to uh, look forward to a new temple that is not of clay. So having said that, guess what? Next week, the bones are gonna come together. Knee upon knee, knee upon thigh bone. Uh, we're gonna come together flesh on flesh tendon on tendon, and skin upon skin. We're excited about it. We're a bit mystified about how this whole hybrid worship thing is going to work. Uh, we'll probably find two or three things that don't work before we find something that does, and that's all right. Uh, but we are coming together uh, trying to trying to do justice to the fact that this pandemic is not over, but the numbers are a whole lot better. The, the trend is a whole lot better. We do have people who for several reasons haven't been vaccinated and may want to, to be safer. Some of them may choose to continue to worship online. That's okay. That's why we're gonna continue to do this. But we've got the, the uh, fellowship hall set up so that the area over, as you're walking in from the front, the area over on the right 
is going to have area for masks and social distancing. The area on the left is going to have area for those who don't feel they need social distancing. Um, by the way, if you come wearing a mask, you don't have to sit in the mask section if you're comfortable wearing a mask in, in the non-distance section. Uh, the, we're not gonna part people like the sheep and the goats. Um, having said that, we're already seeing the first fruits of some people who had never attended before and they're, they're seeing some interest now. I hope you noticed the photograph that I sent out in the email today. Uh, we got a new, new banner up proclaiming that Grace is alive. Uh, I had to put the date on it to say when we're opening. Uh, and I hate that because it, it kind of kind of shortens the shelf life of that particular banner. You don't want to have it up saying June 20th for very long, right? Uh, eventually, we'll want to move on from that. We'll probably just put something over it for a little while. Uh, but are there any, any thoughts, any questions, any comments, any recommendations? As we not get recommendation. ready, go ahead, Bill. I'm sorry, not a recommendation, but I certainly wanted to appreciate uh, and acknowledge whoever designed that did a wonderful job, did a wonderful job. I thought it was very impressive. Oh, thank you for that. Um, that's uh, another one of those jobs I used to do. I used to be a graphic artist. And so uh, Sharon was asking me, is there any job I haven't done? Um, any job that is exceedingly well paying, I have never done. Uh, I was just gonna, to, to compliment the the uh, the banner as well um, as well the the I appreciate the the prayer um, banner uh, uh, as well it, that 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 really does it at least strikes somebody's brain to pay attention to the road number one <laughs> and then also to just turn their thoughts to God for just five seconds so um, I I think the banner looks like a hug and mm -hmm. I think that's what our congregation needs that physical all you people who have not wanted people to hug you all your lives you're in trouble now because i'm right. going to go into overdrive and be hugging everybody <laughs> yesterday was an example of that i just i, I want to hug everybody but yeah the, i thought the banner looked like a hug and i uh really feel like that's what we as our little already existing congregation needs, as well as the greater congregation that's out there um, waiting to come into a, a safe space. So I, I think as long as our message is that, like Pastor Larry was saying, we're not trying to segregate, um, that if you have a mask and you wanna sit on the left side versus the right, this, that, and the other, uh, how do we communicate, how best to communicate that in our signage and whatnot when people arrive to campus and you know we just pray and ask the holy spirit to be there that it'll be thousands and droves but it's probably not going to be that the first session <laughs> people are going to be leery of getting out and whatnot but um how do we always from this point forward looking forward how do we send that message of safe space and a hug because I think that's what those arms see, feel like to me on the flyer. So good job, boss. Amen. Thank you, Sharon. And uh, uh, yeah, yesterday I, I confessed to you that I went around a little church I was serving one time and counted all the signs they had up in the kitchen and other areas that said, don't, don't do it. Don't stop it. Uh, there were 23 signs that said, don't. There were no signs that said we love you. <laughs> so let's uh, let's be conscious of that as we come back together and concentrate on the we love you, uh, David. I, I echo the the fact that the five second prayer uh, signs also help draw the eye to the to the church grounds, and uh, hopefully they help draw the eye to the sign that says we're back. And we appreciate that. 
Any other thoughts, concerns, Joyce? Yes, David. Well, I just want to bring attention to our graduates and that they're facing a, a life ahead and need some, some prophecy to bring God's will into their lives and give them direction. We have ones in college now, and I think you all know the one I'm talking about, uh, especially in Mr. Cole, and hope he finds a way and a path for success and all the other graduates. So keep them in mind for this same thing about we've got the bones and they've got a lot to put together in their life and move forward. So some prayers for all of our graduates, no matter whether they're a part of our fellowship or not, just keep them in mind. It's going to be a pandemic for 15 months for them, and they're coming out some more successfully than others. There's an article in Freelance Star yesterday that interviewed four very successful 4.3 uh, GPA people going to school and saying, how did you get through it? And I think it would be good to maybe the Freelance Star interview some of the ones that are not 4.3 GPA and wonder how they're going to get through it because they seem to have a rougher road ahead in this economy and, 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 and direction that they need to take. So we have all levels of accomplishment that need to be considered in our prayers. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, David. Uh, Janet, I, I should have uh, touched base with you before this moment. I don't know if there's anything you want to share or not, but I have to tell you, the church got a very nice invitation from Withville yesterday. Okay, so. yeah, and and that was he was told to send that, and it's okay to put it in the grace place for everybody to be aware that my son is getting married in August, and he wanted to make the announcement to the church, um, because he has been. You all have been a big part of his life, so and I hope. Uh, uh, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> As you can imagine. <laughs> Janet, I'm going to message you offline. <laughs> We're going to go for a walk in the woods. Just wait till we get in person. Well, I'll be at church hopefully next Sunday. I'll try to get there. We're at the beach right now with mom. So um, we, sh we should be, I should be back in person church with you guys next week. And we can talk then. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Or Thank talk you. to Mike Kerr. He knows the story. <laughs> added added prayers. Like I'm saddling up with David, added prayers for these. You know, I think about our Westview bunch, you know, all our kids. We sent all our kids to Westview, Westview, Westview. And now they're in that college age and they're saying things like religious propaganda. And I'm like, <gasps> so um, prayers for this time frame that I know I'm looking at, you know, Robert, we, we're, I'm looking at the age group. <laughs> we have, we have adults the same age. Um, and so just, just prayers that the seed was planted for sure. Amen. Anyone else? I am um, rejoicing in a prayer. One, the rejoicing is, I, well, but of course also a prayer that happens. Um, my my son this last uh, few days ago said could we start having a bible study you and me together like on sunday afternoon i'm like yeah I, yeah that'd be good that wow neat so i was yeah been blessed by that and uh hope he wakes up and comes down we'll see <laughs> <laughs> um uh, get him to wake up uh, someone said her uh not this last week the week before last it was uh we heard some sirens and stuff, and uh, it looks like an ambulance stopped at our neighbor's house, Jim Wasson, our next door neighbor here. Um, I didn't go over. I didn't want to get in the way of all the emergency stuff. I've called up his place a couple times and just left him messages. I probably should wander over. I, I don't know what happened to him, if he's whatever. So I'm concerned about him, and I'll check on more and what's going on with him, if I can even find out if he's home or not. So. He, he's not not been a member of our church. He's come to a few of our uh, community luncheons on Wednesdays over the last several years, and, um, and some of us know him. Um, so, yeah, Mr. James Wasson. Amen. Thank you for that. We don't hear many <laughs> sirens in my neighborhood either, but anytime we do hear one, I tell Marietta, they're after you. Go outside and turn yourself in. 
Bill? Yeah, I, I, before we leave, I just I wanted to relate one of life's little pleasures. Uh, and we talk about what life gives us uh, is that uh, we live uh, in an area where people feed birds and feed wildlife in general. Uh, and uh, there were a, there was a drake and a hen that would land out on, on the tee box and walk somewhere, never knew where. Uh, but we talked to our neighbor and she was feeding them. And the other day, uh, only the drake showed up. Uh, and of course, you worst case, a fox got the hen or something. something. Well, this morning, uh, the, the hen and the, and the drake walked back across the course to get fed. The little things, but it bring a lot of joy to our life, seeing that, knowing that they are together. Small things, you know, and not approach, not probably not an appropriate converse, contribution to, this, to the conversation, oh, absolutely. but it's one of those life's little things that added value and joy to our life. Oh, no, I think that's totally appropriate. No, Bill, I, I totally do the same thing. I have a, a terrapin, or I should say a box turtle, that comes into the yard every year that I am so overjoyed to see him the first time every year. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Elizabeth, I see that hand. Can you speak to us? Um, yeah, I think I can. I always have to do this from my phone, so it's difficult. <laughs> okay, okay, it is a challenge, but you're there. Congratulations. <laughs> um, I have, I'm asking for prayers. Um, she might as well be my sister. She's not my sister. I've known her since she was two when I was four years old. Um, she's my best friend. Actually, my oldest daughter did not realize that Aunt Diane was not my, her biological aunt until she was in eighth grade. <laughs> but she, so she's two years younger than me and uh, she's at end stage heart failure from a massive heart attack. She's in the Nova Fairfax right now. And she has decided to go with, uh, I think it's called an LVAD. Yeah, left ventric ventricle assist device it's a pump to pump her heart she will have surgically put in so she is in great need of prayers amen and and what was her her name elizabeth her first name diane amen uh thank you for that uh david i have one other thing oh go ahead you were talking about the fragrance that you're smelling yeah. I know my front yard smells wonderful right now because the magnolia tree is in bloom hmm. and it fragrances for quite a ways. <laughs> yes, uh, they, they are magnificent. Uh, a true gift of living in the South. This is evidence. <laughs> the magnolias are evidence that we are closer to heaven in the South. But uh, yes, David. I just want to be sure we add some people in our church who have concerns. And that's, of course, Wanda's possibly having surgery for some gallstones. I mean, some kidney stones, excuse me, removal. Keep her in our prayers, please. Uh, Anne said she's up and doing well, not in pain now, but they're, they're not going away. So they have to do surgical removal next week. Keep her in our prayers. And also Jackie's sister-in-law, who's the same age as Jackie, and Jackie's worried about that a little bit, um, is um, having a, a, a choice now of, going into hospice rather than having a leg amputated and blood clots. You saw that probably in the Grace Place. So keep these families as well as all the others that we don't know about in our prayers for, for God's healing. Amen. David, would you lead us in prayers for those folks, for all of them, and for Elizabeth and her dear friend? Well, I might, might be the best prayer, but I'll give it my best shot. So here we are. God, thank you for this opportunity to be together and for the opening of our church and the plans that are being made and the possibilities that we all look forward to. Please keep all these people in, in our prayers, the, the ones that need your healing, the ones that need your guidance starting off in life, and the ones that uh, need your acceptance in any way that they, they require. So please keep our church in your guidance and wish us best of everything next week in our first live service. Thank you, God, for all you do for us. Amen.
Amen. Go in the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and thank God that you are not in the first church of the zombies. We'll talk to you soon. I love you all. We'll see you in person next week. Love you, everyone. God bless you all. See you next week.